uh, issues or concerns that they've had with what they've been doing um, in, in order to do deep zone tillage. These uh, recommendations to grow. Yeah, yeah I got that. So you got that. I got okay. It. Can I see it? I didn't know. Photos either of you would like to put up there? Go ahead. Okay. I don't have a problem. The only one of mine there is 13 or 20. 20. 20 is my. Okay. 20 is my little teller. See, you did have pictures up there. Huh? I told you you had pictures up there. I know, that's the only one. Yeah. Yeah. But you also have an I've got a six-row unrefer for the for my main crops because I'm primarily a grain grower. But I built that two-row for my strawberries, and uh, it's a pretty simple little machine. And it, as you can tell right there, it works awfully good if you're as long as you have your cover crop or clean ground ahead of time. In other words, that's a field that had rye in it was sprayed in the fall. And I use that for strawberries. So I'm doing that about the first week in April or the last week in March, as soon as I can get in the field to get it ready so I can plant my strawberries in April. And uh, all it is is two chisel shanks and then two sets of closing covering uh, for um, coulters on the back to shape up a ridge. Um, it's, it's a two row machine. I pull it about 13 or 14 inches deep and I'm pulling it with a 30 horsepower tractor right there is all. But there's no fancy equipment on it. If I had the only thing that would have to be different, if I had a uh, a cover crop, a heavy cover crop ahead of time, I'd need a coulter in front of that to cut through. And there's a toolbar in the front there I made so I could put one on, but I've never needed it. So I've only got just the, sh the chisels in the middle and the coulters in the back. And how deep are the chisels? About 12, 13 or 14 inches. No fertilizer or anything. I mean, it'd be easy to put a little tank on there and run a, a hose with a nozzle down the back of each chisel point. You could put fertilizer eight inches deep. If you were going to grow sweet corn or some other crop that needed nitrogen, you could put it on with that eight inches or so. Put about half your nitrogen on early with that and then put the other half on top when you plant your crop. But I don't need it for the berries, so I don't do that. Any questions? about that and then uh, where is an unrefer slide um, Betsy yeah my machine isn't in there it's too big Betsy where is an unrefer slide over number number 16 looks like a good bet okay one above it too isn't that one uh, it might be one right, right. that nine, one there. Yeah, that might be an unreferred. That's there. That one is a, the one above it. Nine. Yeah, that's an unreferred machine. Yeah. That's like mine. Yep. And uh, the advantages, disadvantages of that. Well, that that the only difference between that and mine, I've replaced those baskets on the back with Calder Packer. Uh, little rollers, cultivator packer wheels. I think it makes a little more, it makes a better uh, row to plant in because it firms the soil a little bit. Uh, I like that machine because it's got the straight shanks. We've all we're trying to do with that is to make a slot in the ground that the plant roots can follow down is, is below the compacted layers. I like that better than the parabolic shanks because the parabolic shanks pull up more stones than that will. So that's a, if you're in a stony situation, that machine is a cleaner one to run. Um, I've been using mine for 15 years, and it pulls, you know, takes about half as much power to pull it now as it did when I started. It gets better and better every single year. In fact, I'm to the point now on my gravel and good loam ground, I don't do that anymore. I just strip till plant on top of the ground. But in the heavier ground, heavy clay, I still do that. And, uh, but I put cultivator packer wheels on the back to break the clods up and do a little compaction on the row to firm it up before I'm going to plant. I prefer to do it in the fall 
if somebody needed to know when, in which case I take that back piece right off. I don't need to firm the slot and I don't need to use the basket. So I just have the closing discs and the big shank in the front in the fall and then let Mother Nature take care of, of uh, firming up the row and then just go in and plant on it in the spring. So I prefer to do it in the fall if I have a choice. Um, loosen the ground and get that slot made so that freezing and thawing and whatever will take care of it. But if you have to do it in the spring, then you need either that basket or color with packer wheels or something on the back, or you're going to have the soil is going to be too loose to plant in. Well, you can plant in it, but it's better if you put something on the back there. That doesn't really break up the clods that well. No. That was a, the problem. When George did mine before I started, um, he and I talked about it. I said, I wonder what would happen if you put a color packer wheel on there, because yeah. I've got cloudier ground than he does. Yeah. And works better. Yeah, that yeah. he did it afterwards and that was uh that seemed to be the answer for breaking the clods up. Yep. Yeah, especially in that um we had a dry year and then we really wanted people to go to the cultipackers to right. seal that right. moisture. That's right. Yeah. That's right. If it was wet, um maybe we Then the basket's okay because it'll probably break the clods up if it's wet anyway. Yeah. The yeah. the question of two things in the heavy ground which is where that thing really is needed you're going to get clods. If you get clods, you've got to do something with them. You don't just leave them there to dry out and get hard and then try to plant through them. So, you you know, if the basket will break up your clods, fine and dandy. If it won't, the cul de packer wheels will do a better job of that. But if it's really, really wet, you're going to get too much with that. You know, then you've got to take the spring off and do everything to keep it so it doesn't push down quite so hard. And so it's a, it's a question every year what the ground is like, what kind of soil is it, what field you're in. You don't do it the same way in every field every year. You have to be able to make some adjustments. But the, the shank, the, the cutting disc in the front, the shank, and then the two closing discs stay the same no matter where you are. And that's all you use in the fall. And, and that's another reason I like to do it in the fall, because it's generally drier in the fall. The soil's in better condition. And you're not worried about it wet in the spring, because if you do it in the fall, make your row in the fall, it'll dry out in the spring if it's a wet spring all by itself. And the clods will be gone from, from Mother Nature. So you don't have to deal with those issues if you do your, your deep till or your ripping in the fall. I think that's a better way to go. One of, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I would have, I've kind of toyed with the idea of adding to mine was um, a set of rolling baskets, not rolling baskets, but um, trash uh, trash cleaners in front of the, the ripper point. Uh, oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just when we're using the one row setter to set either seeds or uh, transplants, trash can be a problem if you let it get too right. too yeah. tall. And uh, even if you kill it around up, if you let it get woody at all, you got to kind of keep it. You can spray it when it's in a grass single blade form, or you're going to run into problems. So, um, okay, we've got uh, what what slide is that that you're referring to here now with the trash wheels? Let's see. Um, can you hear me, Carol? It's number eight. Number eight. Okay. Yep. So when I built my unit, I didn't leave enough room to put any stuff on. Um, I didn't really think about pre-row. I was trying to get um, for a real aggressive point on a thing to get down deep, and um, I've tried to put stuff after it, and it doesn't really work. I guess <clears throat> I could probably put a set of row cleaners right before my my hiller disc in the back. Um, you know that could possibly work, or run it after, run the hiller disc and then run these after. Um, I've kind of I've looked at the thing several different ways, and I've got it set pretty good, so it works well the way it is so I just I've never really taken the time to mess with putting these things on but see those in that picture are like my planner you put those on the front of your planner yeah. so I'm yeah. I'm wondering why you couldn't put those on the front of your transplanter that's where they belong but you go so clean that row just before you get right there with the transplanter yeah but you have to don't you have to go like five miles an hour or something no. to make no. them work no they'll, they'll work that slow yep yes. on a transplanter well, I'm not sure I they were a news place in Ithaca, at a half a mile an hour properly, the floating ones which you know got the depth bands well, that's right. here. That's that does a nice job of cleaning. Even at the even, slow even speed, even like a quarter mile an hour, half yeah. a mile. Really? Okay. It's just like a garden rake. Right? Okay. Okay. You're trying to rake the clods. And that's then you don't have to deal with it. Garbage out of the way, but they got to be free floating. Right. At least it might be. They got to have those wheels, treader wheels on the side, the depth wheels, so they don't go too deep. Okay. The floating ones will never make a gouge, a trench. Right. Great. Too many get, you know, in our 
complex top topography and mm -hmm. hills sideways and everything, and they, they will gouge on you sometimes, so yeah, that's not you, good. You go too fast or you have too deep, and then you end up with a depression with all this junk on the sides. Right. It collects water. And yeah, it collects, <laughs> it collects water, and it's it's murder if you've got uh, processing snap beans or dry beans, because you've got your row is below, is starting below the level of the soil. Right. So that means need to have that mini mound still yeah. intact. So, yeah. so um, uh, Carol and um, Jim and Lynn and George, um, I have this picture up, this is Anu, um, of the, the trash wheels. And I do know that Umberfirth has made an adapt, uh, they have created um, a mounting unit for in front of the cutting disc that you can oh. actually put okay. trash cleaners Okay, well that's where there. it belongs. So, Right on the disc. That's where it belongs. Yeah. Right in front yeah. of the it's cutting the disc, side they've side made right. a unit. So I wanted to make sure okay. folks were knew about that. Um, I, okay. Before we move around for questions, I wanted to see if, um, uh, Lynn, you had any other comments on how you got started? Um, well, basically, I was struggling on, on either dry years or excessively dry years or excessively wet years. Um, my ground would pond on a wet year, and on a dry year, nothing would grow. Um, that's kind of what got me started into it. And between a little urging from George and um, Gary Sweet, we had tried zone tillage without any ripping. First year I had tried it, I thought that's where I had to go because it worked. It was beautiful. We got a rain right after I planted. Everything came out of the ground. The pumpkins were beautiful that year. The next year I expanded. Uh, again, I had George uh, plant my winter squash and pumpkins and it was a total failure it was so dry that year uh, the plants didn't germinate when they did germinate they really didn't grow well um, the missing ingredient seemed to be the ripping and making that slot giving it a place to grow uh, the following year if you go back um, to your pictures there I started out with a one shank ripper that I, it was just a subsoiler I had that I used for some drainage it's picture number six uh, that's that was my first experiment right there. I, I took that, went down through, and I ripped four rows um, in the middle of a tomato field on a clay knoll where nothing would grow anyway, with the attitude that if nothing if it doesn't work, well, nothing was going to grow there anyway, so I'm really not out anything. Um, I went through with that, then followed up with a a cub with hiller discs on it. We went back and forth through a couple times, break the clods up. Trans, used a conventional transplanter, planted into it. First thing I noticed was the transplanter worked better than it ever had before, planting on that mound, a nice soft mound. Second thing I noticed was, again, it was a, it started out to be a really dry spring. The transplants hit the ground and just started running from the minute they hit the ground. The, the plants looked way better than the tomato plants on either side of the four rows, the test strip, uh, all season long. I mean, used a, they grew faster. It looked like I had you know, used a different fertilizer program or something. Everything was the same. Um, we had pictures somewhere. I don't know if we have them here today or not, but the, the final result with the, the yield difference was unbelievable. Uh, quality, everything. The tomatoes were bigger. There was more tomatoes on a plant. Um, so that was that's what got me started, and I've been experimenting ever since. Um, I think it's a picture 28 or 21 or something. Um, I, the following year, I built a two-row unit which included the Hiller disc, tried to do everything in one pass. It was in the PTT you sent us. Um, yeah, but she it's, cut some. Okay. So there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be so many. Okay. But similar to George's, actually, but the only difference is I've got straight shanks on mine, um, and I've got a, a set of spider wheels that run behind the ripper, uh, ripper shank to, to kind of break up the clods and um, it does roll some of the sod and stuff out of the way a little bit, and then it's followed up by two hiller discs that are um, the concave hiller discs, okay, to, to throw a nice – the mound I throw is probably like 8 to 10 inches high. I like a good high mound, so after it settles, you're, you've still got a mound there. But um, every experiment that I've done with this so far has been positive. Um, from planting four rows, I'd take that two-row ripper and go out in the middle of a 10-acre cornfield and rip four rows, plant directly into it. You can drive across the end of the field in a pickup truck. Don't even get out of the truck. The corn is six inches to a foot taller than the corn on both sides of it. It's just I haven't had one bad experience with it yet. It seems, for me, it's been the way to go. You, you had a significant compaction problem. Yes. On, on a light soil. 
Right. Yeah. It wouldn't perk at all. Right. <laughs> Which is not unusual on vegetable soil. Tillage pans. Yeah. So, so, so I, um, I wanted to just out of here. Um, I wanted to take a, uh, a, a minute to go around all the locations and see if we had any questions because we wanted to move on to some of the growers on Long Island who have dip used different equipment. So before we move on, I'm going to just add a look at the growers that are here with us in the room in Ithaca. Do you have any questions for George? Yes. Go ahead. George, when you, when you uh, till in the fall, do you have a hard time finding your rows in the spring? No. No, because I end up with about a six inch, six or seven inch wide clean tilled strip there with the mound and it's still visible in the spring. I mean, you have to do fall weed control is the best option for zone tillage anyway. And so the strips are still there in the spring. I don't have any trouble. We have one more question from Ithaca. Are you doing that zone tilling in the fall into a cover crop that will winter kill or into a rye that's still alive in the spring? No, both, uh, a lot of it is into soybean ground that's going to go back to sweet corn or something, so there isn't any cover crop there. It's too late. I may plant rye, but then I do the, the deep till early enough that the rye is just barely coming up. It comes up afterwards, and then we have to kill it in the spring. But, but um, I've done it, when, like I, for my pumpkins, I usually do it either very late in the fall or very early in the spring into standing rye. And again, I don't have a problem getting through the rye or seeing the rows when I get ready to plant. Killed rye. It's killed rye. Yep. Yeah, right. So you won't you won't want to try to plant into green rye. Well, you don't want to plant in anything green if yeah. you can help it. That side, it'll just it'll make a mess and it'll ball up and you, right. you've got to kill that crop. Whatever you plant into, make sure it's dead. If that if that zone builder has a good cutting disc ahead of that shank, you can zone build through anything, but you can't plant through anything green. You want to make sure everything is dead when you get there with a the planter. Takes about a month. Uh, um, you want to spray. What I found is that three weeks to yeah. four weeks before. Three weeks, yeah. 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 Can, you hear me? Um, can we move on to Long Island? Any questions for George or Lynn? Go ahead. Go ahead and ask a question. Yeah, we've got a couple questions. What, okay. What kind of plant? What kind of planter are you using? Me. Yeah. Uh, John Deere. John Deere seven thousand. Same here. Um, I also use a conventional, it's an old, uh, new idea, transplanter. Yeah. Um, I use that. Then I have a newer style with uh, uh, the finger pickup uh, for the, the transplants also. But there's nothing, I've done nothing, no modifications to the transplanters. We just, right. um, if, you, if you build a clean mound, that's something I failed to mention earlier too. You're going to have seasons where you you may have to go back over that where you ripped. I, I With a two-row ripper, I will go through it one direction. If I don't have a nice clean seed bed, I will turn around and go back the opposite direction uh, uh, at the same time. And that usually does enough that it breaks up the clods and clears up the, uh, gives you a nice clean seed bed, a nice mound to plant into. Um, make sure it looks good. You want it to look the way, you got to be happy with the way it looks or you won't be happy with the end result. So um, just make sure you got a clean place to start. Any other questions from Long Island? Yeah, I'm just wondering about having a rolling basket followed by a culture packer, or some of our growers have tried two rolling baskets just to have a really good bed. And this would be um, zone building in the spring. What do you think of those ideas? I uh, don't see any reason it wouldn't work. I've not done that. I've either had the basket or the culture packer. I haven't had both, but I, it should be all right. I think the key in the, if, is to have the culture packer one place or the other so you get the firming up of that row if you're going to do it in the spring. You don't have very long for Mother Nature to do that for you, so you want to do it yourself. Okay, let's move to Jeff Miller. Uh, I have, like, two questions. One is uh, there was a comment made that Someone doing the ripping along with the zone building after a period of time was able to not do that ripping anymore. How long did it take before you got to that point? I don't know. I'm at the point, and it's been different. Each field is different. Um, my heavy ground, I still do the ripping, the heavy clay, because it just seals up so hard every year. But I haven't done any ripping on some gravelly loam around where I live probably for the last Oh, I'd say five years, and I've been doing zone tillage for 15 or 16 years. So 
I probably could have quit quicker. The Ray Rawson, when I started, tried to tell everybody that you could do it two years in a row. You do your ripping one year, and then you split the middles the second year, and then you don't have to do it anymore as long as you don't mess the soil up. And he may have been right. I don't know. I never had nerve enough to do it that way. So I probably went six or seven or eight years before I quit doing the ripping on the good soil. But the heavy clay, I still rip every year. Thank you. And then the second question is, you have a John Deere 7000. Do you have a gang of coulters in front of each planter row? Nope. I have a, I'm, uh, up until this year, I've had the old Unverfirth cart that had a tank and coulters on the cart three coulters to the row and pull the planter behind it. This year I'm going to have a set of uh, trash wheels like you saw in that other picture on the front with a single disc fertilizer applicator off to one side for each row. And I won't use the cart anymore. I don't need it. The cart was needed when I started because if you put the coulters on the planter 15 years ago, you couldn't get the planter in the ground. The ground was too hard. So I got the cart which you could put 500 gallons of fertilizer in, or water, or whatever, for weight, and you could get the thing in the ground. But I'm to the point now, I don't have any problem anymore. So this, from now on, I won't use the cart. I have the same 7,000 planter, but it has a, a no-till coulter, just one coulter in front of each row. Uh, it does a pretty good job. I have two neighbors that have switched to uh, zone till, no till, if you want to call it that. Both of them have Kinsey planters. And they started with a coulter like the one that's in that picture there, uh, the, a single cutting coulter in the front, no-till coulter with a fertilizer unit on. And they don't do the deep ripping anymore. They're in the same shape I'm in, uh, but they're grain producers. And they have a lot of trouble with that, getting the planter in the ground. So everybody around me has taken the no-till coulter off. And the fertilizer opener, they've gone to a smooth, straight slicer disc for the fertilizer opener so that they don't have trouble with those openers holding the planter up out of the ground. Great. Um, why don't we move then last to uh, Massachusetts. Andy, do you have any questions from growers at your site? Do you have any questions on uh, these folks' equipment situation? Let me uh, end off the mic here. Uh, I think it was George who said he only goes 13 inches deep. Is that really adequate to get the plow pan on your fields? Because here, our fields have been farmed about 350 years and packed continually, and I have to go down 17 or 18 inches to get below it. Wow. Okay, what I was talking about was that two-row one that I built for my strawberries. There's no compaction layers in that field because I've zone tilled for years. So I go down 12 or 13 inches when I plant strawberries. The big machine that's the regular Unverfirth for planting soybeans or sweet corn or pumpkins, I go about 17 or 18 inches if in the clay. In the fields where I have done it a number of years and I don't have any compaction anymore, again, I still only go 10 or 12 inches. There's no reason to go any deeper if you don't have a density layer and it pulls a heck of a lot easier 10 inches deep than it does 18. So once you've done it a few years, you can quit going so deep if you don't mess it up and go back in there with a plow or a disc or something and put a layer back in. You need to measure your compaction. Right. Penetrometer. You need a penetrometer or a, a tile rod or something so you can right. detect where your compaction layer is so you can rip just a little deeper. Right. Which is, any I check every field. Um, uh, is there any other questions here? I'm sorry. Any other questions here? Looks like that's it. Okay, great. Lynn, um, I'm sorry I cut you off. You had a comment? No, I just started to say I, I check every field. Um, I go around once or twice, and I jump off and uh, take the penetrometer, and I'll check in the rip and make sure I'm I'm breaking through the hard pan. Um, then that's how I determine how deep I have to go in each field. So most of the time I just run it all the way down. But um, you can tell I just kind of listen to the tractor. You can some fields you can you can, you can tell it's pulling a lot easier. I'll just jump off and check in. If I don't have to run it as deep, I will tend to pick it up a little bit and. Uh, do it that way. So. Great. Um, all right. I think what we want to do is. Um, uh, we've, got, we've got one more question. Can we oh, okay, one go ahead. Yes, actually, I have two questions. One question would be assuming it's dry enough in the spring, is there any good reason not to do the no tillage preparation in the spring? Because conventionally on Long Island, we have sandy loyal. Uh, loam soils, if we do field preparation the season before in the fall, we have wind and uh, water erosion. 
I I do all of mine in the spring. Um, I cover crop with rye on all just about all of my ground. Um, and again, like I said, three weeks to four weeks before I'm going to rip, I'll go through and spray with Roundup, and then go back through um, and and do my my tillage. And that that seems it's been a pretty good combination for me. So I don't have a problem with spring as long as you can do the ripping two or three weeks ahead of when you're going to plant to let that row get healed up. And if you put the colder packer on the back, you'll do a little better job. The problem is that slot will stay open and you'll have loose soil for a while, for a short period after you do it, until you get a heavy rain or till it just naturally settles in. So I don't like it in the spring if you've got to do it with right away and then try to plant right afterwards. We had a trial in Wayne County uh, with Mike Stanyard some years ago on beans, and the guy ripped today and he planted the beans tomorrow, and they were terrible because he's planting beans in a one-inch wide slot that's nothing but a big air pocket. You have to either do it in the fall or do it far enough ahead in the spring so it heals up. All right, um, let's, oh, can we um, hit yep. our mutes? Thank you. Um, I think it, do we have, do we have Thomas on? I don't see him on yet. Okay. All right, so we wanted to move to uh, Long Island because we had a, growers that were using some slightly different, uh, some different equipment there. Um, and uh, so do we have Jen and? Yeah, we're here, Anu. Okay. Um, so I did make, um, I did put all of the pictures for our Jen's set up um, on a PowerPoint, and I think Betsy sent that out this morning. Um, I will put it up on our screen as well so you can all see it. <clears throat> so go ahead, Jen. I'm just waiting for the pictures so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Hi, this is Thomas. I am connected. Oh, okay, Thomas. We'll be right with you. Okay. I didn't see that is a uh, no-till grain drill that we purchased. The sunflower, seven foot wide, um, seven and a half foot wide, so that we can no-till cover crops into the fields that we are resting for a year. We grow pumpkins specifically. One year it rests, one year is in pumpkins. And uh, one of our biggest problems is... Phytophthora and keeping it away because we don't have enough ground to rotate in. So we're trying to build up the soil um, to protect itself uh, against the Phytophthora. So the no-till drill has given us some options to try other cover crops. This past year, we tried um, oats and alfalfa. Uh, that's it going down the field. Um, so you can see that it, it does a nice job in, in the field with, without tillage. Um, we also used it to plant sorghum Sudan grass, and third, we planted our rye in the fall, um, which is about three bushels to the acre, and then we used the rye in the springtime as the mulch for the pumpkins. That is our zone builder. That was earlier in the season when we were just testing it out, and we had what they're called the shark tooth reduced um, residue managers and they're in the front of the coulter and then we also had shark tooth behind the coulter and we found we had about four bushels of rye to the acre this past year so there was a lot of residue on the field and we found that the, even the two sets of shark teeth residue managers were not clearing enough to make a nice zone so what we did was we got more aggressive residue managers behind the coulter and there should be another picture that might be the one. I can't really see it well. And that's it. Yeah, that's right. That was earlier in the season there. That's the two shark teeth. And right there, there's hardly any residue, but the pictures previous, that's where we had a, a ton of residue. So we found that putting the um, more aggressive residue managers behind the coulter really helped push more of the rye away. This was our first year using this zone builder. Um, originally, we've used a water wheel transplanter to transplant our pumpkins directly into the rye, and we were noticing that they weren't, there wasn't as good of a stand, they weren't growing as well, and we knew that they needed more. And this zone built up a nice eight inch zone where, with fluffy soil, and they grew very well. Um, we just need some more time to perfect it. Those are some of the strips that you can see that we prepared and um, 
it made a nice little zone there and you can see the amount of residue in between and there's a lot of residue there even with all of that residue though we had some trouble with weeds so that's one of the questions that we have is weed management and also with that is also the and there's the pumpkins and we put um, tea tape down so that we can water and also fertigate with and another one of our questions is fertilizer inside this zone and is it being t is are the weeds taking away from the fertilizer and how we can compete with the weeds so there's two issues in here it's the taking care of the weeds and also knowing if if we need to do something different with our fertilizer at this point in time we have purchased a John Deere planter a Pequa planter corn planter that we would like to try seeding the pumpkins in the ground rather than transplant planting because it would take a lot less time and labor. I don't know if there's any other questions. How did you manage the rye? I mean, you got a lot. Of, you said you got a lot of rye there. How did you? When did you cut it? At what stage did you cut it? And how did you get it that that we've, manageable? We've tried several different. We've tried cutting it tall. We've tried cutting it short. We have a flail chopper that we've used. Um, we've had difficulty with that when it's got too t gotten too tall. So we use a rotary rotary mower. We'll cut it down and we'll go through and fluff it up again. Um, what we're really interested in is rolling. We had a, just a roller that we used to roll our lawn and we tried rolling some of the, the rye and that seemed to work but we found that you can't go in the same direction that you are with the zone builder otherwise that rye just wraps right up so we're considering trying this year going crossways and so we didn't know if anybody had any um, experience with the rollers because there are rollers available that we've seen on the front of tractors right in front of their planter and they go through and roll and plant right at the same time so we're interested in that as well. We rolled high rye with a color packer and then planted right in it. The pumpkins came up but we had problems with fertility. Mm. People so planted, why don't, planted why don't through it. Hmm. Oh, sorry about that. Um, Jen, uh, I wanted to see if there was any questions, any of the questions from Massachusetts from any of the growers there with the system? Um, we have one here. Hold on. This is Wally Zykowski. We try and plant in as big a rye as possible, but we don't cultipack it or roll it or anything. We just spray it with Roundup. It's usually in the head stage when we do it. And uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It has to be really, really dry when we're working it, though, so you don't tangle up. When it's wet, it's like wire. Um, I don't know... What's the advantage to knocking the ride down? That's what I don't understand. Can you answer that? Yeah, I can answer it, but give me a half a day to think about it. <laughs> My understanding is if you let it drop, and I've heard that from Steve Groff, that it, it falls in various directions, and so it's harder to plant into. So we've, what we've done is we roll, and then we hit it with Roundup, and that's just to keep the drift down. I don't think you could run a zone builder through large dry. So if you're looking to build a zone, that might be a, a problem. The person from Yetter that we talked with uh, used the analogy, you, you couldn't comb your hair if one end wasn't fastened. And so rolling it down <laughs> gives the zone builder more of an opportunity to, to work. I wonder if you could kill the rye when it's standing and go through the zone builder when it's standing <coughs> without knocking it down. But then you don't get that. Once you knock it down, even if you go straight, you still get that. It's not perfectly straight. You still get that mixing, you know. Sometimes I try to roll and if it's, But if it's standing, you're not going to get that mixing. It's upright. You might be able to go through the, with the machine and make, a, and make your zone. What about after with a planter, though? The if it, if it corn, fell after the and cedar or the transplanter? Cedar. Cedar would go right through it. Not so get why it. don't we, do we have any other yeah. questions from Massachusetts? Especially with this. If you're not going to knock the rye down, doesn't that affect the light, light getting to the crop of uh, pumpkins? It knocks down when you plant it, guys. When you run, the wheels of the tractor will run it over and it'll knock most of it down. You're better off. We found George does it, and I do it too. Go th leave it standing and go through that way. 
let the wheels of the tractor knock it down, both between your deep tillage and your planting. Um, it opens it up. It knocks probably 85%, 90% of it down, and the rest falls within a couple of weeks. It, it'll fall down. Um, it looks good after you've finished. And if it's really dead, the colder will cut. The, quite, the key is you got to get the roundup on the rye far enough ahead so it's dead when you go to plant it. And I agree with Lynn. I think I can get through it with his own builder and the planter much better if I haven't rolled it. The one year that I did try rolling it, that it got too big, you have to go the same way with the roller. You can't go backwards or it all balls up. And I can't roll my field precisely enough to know exactly where my planter's going to go. So I had big trouble that year. If you just kill it when it's about 24 inches tall or 30 inches high and let it fall down, and you've done it three weeks before you're going to plant pumpkins, your planter won't have, and the deep teller won't have any trouble going through there. Yeah, and it, even if you go the same direction, it still tends to wind up on the yep. on the wheels of the planter. Yep. Um, yeah, I found it's far better to just leave it standing when you go through it, and um, it, it doesn't seem to ball up at all. Once in a while you get some, but for the most part, it'll, it won't plug your wheels up, and uh, you don't have to get back and chop that stuff out of there. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Um, uh, because we are behind schedule, I'm going to ask folks to hold their questions for Jen, and we'll come back to them.